Amen. Well, you can see from your uh, bulletins that uh, the title we have for our time together in uh, these first 12 verses of chapter 9 is, uh, Will You Come to Siloam and See? It's pretty straightforward tonight, just a yes or no question. But I am grateful to God for uh, having brought us here to these 12 verses as I, I do believe that He has a lot for us to see and perhaps to re-see. But before we give ourselves to that, would you uh, join me as I pray for us? Shall we pray? Almighty God and Father in Heaven, I join Harold in praying for our spiritual nourishment tonight. You are the Good Shepherd and you lead your people into patches of green and lush truth. And I pray, O oh God, that by your holy word, you would fill our souls. You would lift our minds to see the Lord Jesus. And O oh God, I pray for help tonight as I seek to lead us through these 12 verses. I pray, O oh God, that I would humble myself under your mighty hand and that you would lead us. Father, may we worship you now as you instructed in spirit and in truth. We pray in Christ and through Christ. Amen. Well, in the days of Jesus, if you were alive and if you lived in Jerusalem and you were to exit the temple with Jesus as he does at the end of Chapter 8, verse 59, he exit the t exits the temple and say if you were to accompany him out of the south end of the temple in Jerusalem and you were to continue walking south, uh, shortly after walking a little over a quarter mile you would have come to a, a man-made pool and the name of this pool was Siloam. Uh, Siloam, which we learn from verse 7 in John chapter 9, translates into English as sent. Now the pool sat at the end of a 1,749-foot uh, tunnel that, if we know our Bible history well, King Hezekiah, some 700 years earlier, he had cut into the rock face of underground Jerusalem. Up at the Gihon Spring where flowed natural and fresh water, this king had wisely cut this tunnel uh, to preserve the water in its natural and clean state. And by the days of Jesus, it was uh, collected in this pool, which is called uh, Siloam, where Jesus passes by as he exit, exits the temple. Now the water, having been preserved uh, clean and pure, was suitable uh, should you have had the need to wash. And in the ancient world, they would use pools and baths for uh, places of, um, uh, to clean, but also places to congregate uh, and to spend time together. Now, uh, originally, this pool was a place to wash mud or dirt off of one's uh, body. And then Jesus came and forever changed uh, this physical place, but also what this physical place uh, represents. Ever since Jesus came, as we read in verse 1 of chapter 9, as Jesus passed by, nearby this pool, a Siloam has become a place not just to wash physically, but for us it's a place to wash spiritually. It's a place to have not necessarily mud removed from our bodies, but mud removed from our eyes. Mud removed from our hearts. So when I ask you, will you come to Siloam and see, what I'm asking you is, will you come with me into these 12 verses? Because the name Siloam now means to come with John into these verses and to see three things. Uh, one, what Jesus did in the first seven verses. What did he do and what does it mean? And why has God permanently written it in the Holy Bible. Uh, second, what effect did what Jesus did have? What effect did Jesus' work in opening this man's eyes have on this man and on his neighbors? 
And then finally, as we look at verse 12, what are we to do? There's something specific uh, that God would have us do. Now, if we do that, if you accept my invitation to come to Siloam and see, you and I will leave tonight as this blind man left the pool. We'll leave seeing. We'll leave seeing the Lord Jesus, and we will leave blessed by what we see. So let's go together to the first seven verses and look at what Jesus did. Now, he did four things. The first thing he obviously does is he answers the disciples' question in the first five verses. So you'll remember that a, a mob of Jews has gathered. And as we looked at in a very much of an overview way last week, they have gathered uh, because this group of professing believers have now turned a group of professing prosecutors uh, and they were ready to stone Jesus. And as they uh, lifted the stones to kill him, he quietly and calmly exits the temple and makes his way down. And John tells us that he saw a man who had been born blind uh, from birth. Now, the disciples evidently see uh, this man too, and they are asking Jesus a question. Seeing this man has triggered in their mind uh, something that they uh, already believe. It, it has, seeing this blind man has prompted a question with how they see the world. We sometimes use the word worldview to describe that. Uh, but this man, his condition, has prompted a question that comes from the disciples worldview and they asked Jesus rabbi who sinned who sinned was it this guy or was it his folks that's responsible for his condition who sinned now as we looked at this morning their thinking uh, is that of Job's friends and it's it's a whole lot more common I think than than we realize it goes something like this all right if God is is righteous as I've been told that he is if God uh, does the right thing, if he's just, then he must punish wrongdoing. He must punish sin, right? Okay. Now, if uh, sickness, if death, if ailment, if aging <laughs> are the result of sin, well, doesn't it stand to reason that any ailing condition uh, must be punishment for sin, right? Right? It's a very simple, uh, natural way to think. And the disciples thought this way. And so they conclude that if he's in this condition and God is who we think he is, someone has sinned. Now, Jesus, we want to be good disciples. So tell us who sinned so we won't sin like him and end up like that. Now, uh, many people think that way. They, uh, in fact, I've had experiences in ministry particularly devastating experience where I can think of one instance where the father uh, of a wayward child who eventually lost this child as, he, as she was found uh, comatose on her birthday and ended up passing away from a substance abuse overdose. This father who'd been in a Presbyterian church his whole life called me up and said, what did I do? How did I sin for my daughter to be so wayward? You see, we think, we believe this more often than we realize. And so what Jesus says is not just something uh, that we need to repeat, but something that we need to see uh, afresh. Uh, when Jesus says it wasn't this man, he didn't sin, it wasn't his parents, but in fact this blindness is that the work of God might be revealed, both in him and in his Blindness, And then Jesus follows that in answer to the question with something very uh, helpful and immediate. He says that time to do the kind of work that God is about to do with this man's blindness is running out. <laughs> and notice he says, he doesn't say that time for me to do the work. He says time for us to do the work. He says, I believe in verse 4. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So what's about to happen is the work that not only Jesus but his disciples are to participate in. And anyone who calls themselves a disciple is to be a part and about of the kind of work that Jesus is doing. And then Jesus follows 
that by saying what we've looked at many times uh, in the previous weeks, that Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. What's about to happen is you're going to see what I was trying to get the Jews to believe. They wanted to stone me for what I'm about to do. And what does he do next? John says that having said these things, he spits on the ground. And then he makes mud, and then he takes the mud, and he puts the mud on the blind man's eyes. Now, since we're thinking about this sign uh, spiritually, you can think about that mud as what lays spiritually over your eyes before the Spirit of Jesus comes and enables you to see. You can't open your own eyes. There is a... There is a a, a paste from the ground from which you have come that lies over your eyes that unless Jesus opens them, you can't see him. Now, having done this, having pasted this man's eyes with mud, he says, go, wash, and the man complies. And then John testifies that this man came back seeing. Now, let that sink in. A blind man had Jesus spit on the ground, make mud, put it on his eyes. He was told to go into this pool of Siloam. He washed and he came back seeing. Now, this is a sign. This is pointing to something bigger than what's actually happening. And what's it pointing to? It's pointing to two Old Testament prophecies that if you knew were being fulfilled, you would think about Jesus differently. Uh, and the two are Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 42. I'm just going to, all I'm really going to do is read these verses with this story in mind. I want you to do the same with me. I'm just going to look at six verses in Isaiah 35. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, I'm on page 595. This is a beautiful scene. This is the prophet Isaiah, not knowing how what he's about to say would come true. He just knew that it would. The prophet of God says, the wilderness and the dry land. Now, he's probably thinking about uh, spiritual dryness, the wilderness, people who don't have revelation, people who don't have light, as John would describe it. So these would be probably the non Jews, people sitting by the roadside um, who are in a condition, a spiritual condition of wilderness and dryness, just like this man beside the pool. The desert, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. And he just describes an oasis, a hot desert uh, is going to become an oasis of life. And is that not what took place when Jesus showed up by that pool? This man is deserted as far as he's concerned physically and spiritually. And then an oasis of life shows up to him and he doesn't yet realize it. It shall blossom and rejoice. It shall have the glory of Lebanon, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord the majesty of our God. Verses 3 and 4 say that God will come and will save. And when He does that, what's going to happen when God comes and saves and transforms spiritual wildernesses into spiritual oases? What's going to happen? Verse 5, The eyes of the blind shall be opened. Now why is that? Verse 6 of Isaiah 35, waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. In other words, someone is going to come and someone is going to transform spiritual deserts into oasis of spiritual life. Someone is going to come from God and someone is going to open people's eyes, not just physically as Jesus did in John 9, but spiritually. So what John is saying is that when Jesus in that very ordinary, humble everyday fashion passed by that man, he fulfilled the Word of God. Now there's a lesson in there which I won't spend too much time on. It's just that God can be moving and is moving in dramatic ways through the most ordinary of circumstances. This was a boring scene. 
If you went to Jerusalem and you saw the Pool of Siloam, you would think uh, it was a dump. This was an ordinary scene of a man just going to take a bath and comes back seeing. And John says or implies that's the fulfillment of God's holy word. And Isaiah 42 says the exact same thing. Isaiah 42 is the historic, uh, it's the classic uh, foretelling of God's Messiah. <laughs> this is God's Messiah. This is God's King who's going to rule the world. And the Father says to the Son, I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. Verse 6 of Isaiah 42. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people. Now what does it mean for Jesus to be the new covenant? Isaiah says, he will be a light for the nations. And as light for the nations, as the light of the world, what's he going to do? Isaiah says, he will open the eyes that are blind. And what does he mean by opening eyes that are blind? He's going to bring out prisoners. Those who have lived a life that feels as though day in and day out they do nothing but spend their days in an incarcerated prison. He's going to stay in that. He's going to liberate them by opening their eyes. Now let's think about this for a second. Okay? So John's saying that what you all already know, that Jesus has fulfilled powerful prophecies of being God's King and God's Lord. But he's done something in these first seven verses that I want to help us see. He showed us how to spend our time. Jesus says, night is coming. And what he means by that is that your time on this earth uh, is not unlimited. <laughs> uh, I heard a very helpful illustration one time about, about uh, such a thing that, you know, if you imagine your life like a clock, and if you're born, say, at 6 a.m., and you die at you know, 6 a.m. in a 24-hour period, every phase of life is the passing of an hour. So, you know, your, your, your elementary years might be 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Your teenage years might be 9 a.m. to 12 to, to 11 a.m., and so on and so forth as you progress through your life. And uh, no matter where we are on that clock, our time will run out. And what's implied here by John in the first seven verses is, would it not be best to spend our days doing what Jesus did? Doing the works of God? Now what does that mean? That means taking all that God has given you. Taking your job. Taking your family. Taking your gifts. Taking your interests. Uh, taking your assets. Whatever is entrusted to you. Taking all that and finding ways to communicate to your neighbors that your God reigns. Taking all that you have and finding a way to communicate that the Jesus I follow is the Jesus you need. To spend our energy doing that, John says, is what it means to give ourselves to the works of God. And I'll say quickly that this takes time. <laughs> it takes time to explain the gospel. It takes commitment to embody the gospel, to live it out, and it takes love to express the gospel. But Jesus says that's the work to which we should be giving our life, that to which we should be giving our energy. That should be the dominant focus of our life, is communicating what, had, what transpired by that pool, that God had come and God now reigns. So that's the the miracle. That's that John proves Jesus once more to be the Messiah. Now let's spend our time thinking about uh, what effect this had. What First, what effect it had on the blind men and then on his neighbors. Uh, and it's very clear, isn't it, <laughs> what effect it had on the blind man is that he was changed. He was not the same man going back from the pool that he was going into the pool. There was marked change. Having met the Son of God, he no longer walked in darkness. He no longer sat in darkness, literally. He now walked in light, literally. And that's a, that's a walking image. Or that's a living image from the Bible of what should happen when we meet Jesus. And what's important 
is that he was unrecognizable to his neighbors. This is really important. When you meet Jesus, you ought to be different than when you first met him. There ought to be a marked difference about you. People should be able to say about you, is this not the same person I used to know? This cannot be, verses 8 and 9. It, it's just like it. This actually isn't the, the boy I grew up with, the girl I grew up with. There's something markedly different if your eyes have been opened the way John would have you would, the way John would want you to allow Jesus to open your eyes. If that's happened to you, if you claim to be born again, if you claim to be a Christian, people should say that there is something different about this person as I knew him before he met Jesus and, and now that there's something markedly different, him having now actually met Jesus. There's change, real change. And without that kind of change, we should say, one, have I ever really met Jesus? And two, if there hasn't been any change for a long time, ought I meet him again? Not in a saving way, but just in a redirecting, reuniting way. So the effect of Jesus' work is change in this man's uh, physical life, which is a sign of what should happen in our spiritual life. Our hearts should be different. But uh, more than that, what I want you to see more importantly is that by that recognizable change, by being different, having been encountered by Jesus, uh, notice uh, that you will start to gain the attention of your neighbors. As you start to live a, what others would consider a radical life in following Jesus, you don't do what you used to do, you don't talk like you used to talk, as you begin to live that way and be different, your neighbors, just like this man's neighbors, will start to notice. You will see there, as they're having this debate among themselves as, a, as to whether this really is the same uh, blind man, that his transformation gives him an opportunity to speak to his neighbors. He doesn't have to go creating an opportunity. His own personal transformation has, has brought on their interest in Jesus. They say to him, um, no, you know, they are going back and forth, um, you know, trying to, trying to uh, decide on this man's identity. And they get to uh, verse 10. And they ask him, well, then how were your eyes open? So they're now interested in Jesus. And what's amazing is his transformation gives him permission to speak in the public square. His transformation, his personal transformation, having, been met, uh, having met Jesus and been changed, gives him permission to speak into the public square. He says in verse 11, the, the man named Jesus... He made mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. I did. I came back and now I see. He had an opportunity to speak into the public forum. A forum which Christians today are closed off from. Or if they're not closed off from, those doors are shutting very, very fast. We're losing our ability to speak in the public square. And what I'm saying to you is that if Jesus changes your life... The public square will come to you. You don't, have to, you don't have to work your way into a center of influence. You'll just live and be a center of influence. Now to try to convince you of this, I want to tell you a, a story um, about um, several people. Uh, but several years ago, uh, a man by the name of Eric Metaxas, he wrote a popular, what became a very popular biography of a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Some of you may know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some of you may not. Uh, he was a German evangelical uh, pastor, a professor who was uh, martyred under Nazi Germany. And the name of uh, Eric Metaxas' book was called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. Uh, now, as this book gained popularity, there was a man by the name of uh, Alan Wolfe. Uh, who was a uh, self-professing, uh, liberal, non-Christian. He was a political scientist and sociologist at Boston College. He was, uh, at the time, he was the director uh, of the Boise Center for Religion and Public American Life. Uh, and he was also then on the board of this um, foundation called The Future for American Democracy. And he wrote this article for a, uh, a um, left-wing journal called The New 
Republic. And the, the title was called The Grounds of Courage. So he reads Diedrich Bonhoeffer's life, as told by Eric Metaxas, and listen to what he says. What gives an individual the courage to act as Bonhoeffer did? In his case, there were many reasons for valor, but clearly included among the causes of this man's bravery must be Bonhoeffer's complete and absolute devotion to God. He saw that just by reading this man's life. I would be less than honest, Alan Wolf wrote, if I did not admit that bringing this man so vividly to life in these pages raises some awkward questions for the liberalism in which I have put my faith. Is it possible to face death with courage without knowing that a better life awaits? Can faith help overcome torture? Does Bonhoeffer's greatness prove his rightness? Does Bonhoeffer's greatness, his courage in submitting to the call to be a martyr and submitting to the cost of following Jesus, does that greatness prove the rightness in the gospel and in the Jesus he followed? That's what, uh, to put it one way, someone on the blue team right now wrote. That's what someone who's placed their faith into secular liberalism said about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that I watch this guy be a Christian and I have to ask some hard questions about where I put my faith. Now, who among us is following Jesus? I put myself in here too. Who among us is following Jesus in a way that's making whoever our cultural and political opponents are say things like that? Who among us is living the Christian faith? Who among us is following Jesus in a way that makes people like that say things like what Alan Wolf wrote? That's the way forward, brothers and sisters. That's how we're going to persuade our opponents to become Christians. That's how we're going to witness to say, yes, Jesus really is the light of the world. Evidence, not my arguments, but how I treat my spouse. Not what I know up here, but how I love in here. That's the way forward. And doesn't that clarify what we must do? As we move now to verse 12. There's a sadness, I think, with which this story ends. And I know it's not over. Next week we'll look into the second half of it. But I do, I see a sadness in how this story ends. Specifically, as... Um, the, this, this, uh, this man's neighbors are asking the question, where is he? Where is this, this person, this one you've called Jesus? Where is he? <laughs> We'd like to meet him. Now, take those words and look at what's going on around you in the world. And do not those words fit underneath how our world's behaving? Where is this Jesus that you say is the light of the world? Where is this Jesus that you Christians say has brought forth a kingdom of love and of light and of power? Where is he? I'm ready for him. Where is he? That's the question I hear the world asking. Where is he? And what's, what's Jesus' answer to that? Where is, where is he supposed to be? Here here in the gathered presence, the gathered community of his body. This, this, the church, is where the world needs to come to find Jesus. The question is, why aren't they finding him here? Why are are those who are giving in to radicalism of any kind, whether it be a secular radicalism, I'm just going to be worldly, as Alan Wolf has chosen, I'm just going to be liberal and progressive and put my hope in new ideas, whether it's radical in, in, an, in an Islamic direction. Why are those people who are clearly looking for life, why aren't they finding him where he's supposed to be found? And that's what makes this verse so sad 
The blind man whose eyes were open didn't know where Jesus was. Now we, whose eyes have been opened spiritually, are supposed to know where Jesus is. We're supposed to be able to point people to where to find Him. And we're supposed to live lives that embody His power. That we can be free from what the world is bound to because Jesus has opened our eyes. We don't have to live the way you live. We don't have to get mad at what you get mad at. Why? Because we have something better and more powerful that we're hoping in than anything you can take away or anything that we can achieve. So are we a place where Jesus can be found? Is Third Presbyterian a place where citizens of Birmingham can find the King of Heaven? Can, can someone come and worship in here off the street and can they hear the King of Heaven speak? Is Third a place where the blind can come and find the one called Jesus and live in and through Him? Is, are we a place where the religion of the Bible, and I just mean the, the doing of the faith, are we a place where the religion of the Bible and the religion of Jesus is actually in our shoes? Is it are we really the church of religion and shoes? I believe that we are. But I also think that Jesus says, your energy needs to be on me. Your focus needs to be on me. If you want to know what to do with the hours remaining before darkness comes, you come to me and you figure out how can you make me seen as I really am? How can you disclose me as the king and God that I am? And there are lots of ways to do that. You know, um, as we finish here, um, I heard our dean, the dean of the seminary I attended, Timothy George, uh, ask a group of pastors a question. Uh, what would you like to see happen in your church in the next five to ten years? Uh, and it was, it was interesting to listen to some of the answers. Um, and I, I kind of wonder if, if Dean George were to sit Richard and I down and David, um, and he were to ask us that question as we're looking at John 9. I think we would all together say with one voice that we want to see here at Third Presbyterian, we want to see in Jesus what the apostles saw. When we look at Jesus, we want to see what they saw. We want to see the light of the world. We want to see someone who can open the eyes of the blind. Someone who can lead the imprisoned out of prison. Someone who can raise the dead. That's what we want to see. And we want to give ourselves to the study of the Bible until we see it. But not just seeing. It's not just getting stuck up here. It's to... The second thing we, I think we would want to see is we want to live for Jesus the way saints like Bonhoeffer did. We want to live for Jesus like that. We want to get people's attention by how we love. And that's the last thing I think that I would want to see is that we love one another the way Jesus loved this blind man when he said, Go, wash, and be made new. We want to commit to one another, loving one another to the point that we become new. That's what being a Christian is all about. And if we're not in it for that, we're probably not really in it. So this Jesus that's before you here in these 12 verses is a powerful Lord. And he can open your eyes if you'll let him. So let's pray together. Almighty God, how we thank you for the Lord Jesus. How I thank you for the Lord Jesus. How I praise you that you can open the eyes of the blind. That you can awaken the dead. That you can redirect us, God. And oh, how I pray that you would. Oh, how I pray that we would be gripped by the Jesus we see in the Bible and we would want to follow him seriously and passionately until the night that you've appointed for our lives comes. So Father, as we go forward from this place, would we leave motivated to be Christian? 
We pray it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.